But let me go into what happened to the Jetsons. Jetsons, we're not living in Jetson world, are we? What happened? Well, what happened was that a lot of people said, we don't want to live this way. A lot of people in this room, a lot of people that I work with, and we said, no, we're not going to go that way. We're not going to go the Jetson way. We're not going to go with this great distancing, the psychological distancing. And let me just quickly talk about that psychological distancing. We, we saw this sort of, this, with, Vin, with Purcell, we saw this efficiency drive. We see this, you know, if you love efficiency, you'll always end up by wanting to support compulsion, including elimination. Do people here know what efficiency, you know the definition of efficiency? Maximum input. Right? Minimum effort. Sorry, maximum output for minimum effort and minimum time. Maximum output for minimum effort and minimum time. Our entire industrial agriculture system, our entire system is based on that efficiency. You know, the minute manager, I think there's the nanosecond manager out there somewhere. Right? That is one of the great ethics behind what I talked to this cold evil. We have to have an efficient society. Right? What if I were to tell you, which is true, that I have a daughter and a son. Kailani and Nicholas and I treat them very efficiently. Uh, minimum input of affection and attention for maximum good grades and good behavior. Good parent? Terrible, Terrible parent, right. right. I love dogs. And my dogs, my relationship with my dogs is the most inefficient relationship imaginable. I lavish love, affection, and care on these animals who produce no work, no value whatsoever. You know, they pee on the rug occasionally or chew a baseball glove, but they, they you know, it's, it's, it's a horrifyingly inefficient relationship. And, you know, imagine being an efficient friend. You know, three in the morning. Andy, this is Cindy, Joe left again. You know, I know you got a degree in psychology. Can you help me out here? Sorry, I have a talk to give tomorrow in Melville, New York. That would be an inefficient conversation for me. We treat, through our agricultural system and our entire industrial system, we treat living things, all of nature, including ourselves, based on efficiency. Efficiency is a great ethic for a machine. It's a terrible ethic to treat anything that's living, whether that means us or those 175 chickens per minute that are efficiently going through that animal factory. It is devastating. It is one of the great pinnacles of cold evil. It is this belief in efficiency, this mistaking life as machine, and this is, by the way, written into our laws. We can now patent animals and plants as machines. I fought it unsuccessfully. You hear I won on DNA, but I have not yet won. We have not yet won on plants or animals. They are still considered patentable machines under Section 101 of the U.S. Patent Act. So this isn't just you know, philosophy 01 or sermon 01. This is actually written to our laws. And thousands of plants and animals have been patented as machines. The worst I saw was the Texas A&M. They patented the beagle. The beagle, the dog. Because they found that beagles were very obedient in laboratory circumstances when they were being experimented on. So they patented the obedience of the beagle. We challenged that patent in court, and we also went down to uh, Texas A&M and got the students there to put beagle stickers everywhere, <laughs> including all over the car of the regents. So everywhere they went, they saw beagles. They gave up that patent voluntarily after, the, after our lawsuit. But so we treat, if, so what, if we don't treat, if we don't treat living things with efficiency, what do we treat living things with? What, what is, what, how should we treat living things? Love, kindness, respect, empathy. We know the answer. We just don't live it. You know? And I don't always live it. I mean, when I, when I testify in Congress, you heard that I do. When I go and argue in front of the Supreme Court, I very rarely use that language, to be honest with you. People talk about efficient use of natural resources. Isn't that what you're supposed to be? You know, I have worked with hundreds of environmental attorneys, hundreds of, of attorneys working for animal welfare 
over my you know, 45 years of working on this, and um, I have yet to have one come up to me and say, you know how I got into this, Andy? I devoted my life to animal welfare, devoting my life to human health is because I want to see more efficient use of natural resources or, or more efficient, and never, never one. It's because they love those animals. It's because they love those mountains. It's because they respect. We've lost that language with this efficiency thing. And by the way, when we talk about, you, you know, people always say, Andy, you know, humans are so arrogant. You know, we treat the whole world efficiently. You know, we're like, we're the big lords. Like, we're the big gods. I go, I don't really buy that. Because the system treats us the same way it treats the rest of us, right? I mean, 60 million of us are on psychotropic medication to get through the day. 80 million of us are on some kind of medication to try and get sleep at night. It's really clear that this system doesn't fit our circadian rhythms, doesn't fit our lives either. If you have to be medicated, oh, and by the way, 500,000 children, 500,000 children that are in preschool or in the first two grades are also on psychotropic medication to get through our school day. We have clearly also had a, quote, efficient system of work, efficient school system that has nothing to do with respect, love, and empathy for the human system, for our relationship to be able to participate. So people say, you think we're going to genetically engineer humans, Andy? And I go, we don't need to. We're already being chemically engineered by the tens of millions in order to comport with this system. Sometimes you're depressed because it's very depressing to work in a system that doesn't respect you and doesn't respect who you are. Sometimes you're anxious because it's a blood sport in this country. If you lose your job, you lose your house and you have to move in and it's very anxiety provoking. It's not your fault. It's the system was not made for your emotional, spiritual, psychological well-being. It was made for the efficiency of their profits and the efficiency of their machines. And that's cold evil. And it's cold evil when millions of kids with all sorts of ideals and callings have to go into a work system that lets them and forces them to spend decades of their lives in work that is not meaningful or important to them, but work that simply increases the efficiency of the machine of the system. Right. So that's one of the great pillars. Let me go to another great pillar, competition. Now I coach baseball. I'm very proud that my little league team was the champion down at Virginia. Um, I think competition has a place. Just like efficiency has a place with machines, competition is fun. Competition is great. But what if it's, what if it's your governing ethic? Right? Capitalism. What's the basis of capitalism? Supply and demand. Now, how do you govern supply and demand through? Competition. All right, let's go back to my kids, shall we? Nicholas and Kailani. And I say, okay, guys, competition here. So, Nick, what'd you get in your report card? Hey, Dad, you know, I have an A minus average. That's good, Nick. Kailani, what'd you get? It's just a B, B minus, Dad. Kailani, you are the weakest link. Goodbye. <laughs> what? Just preparing them for the real world, aren't I? Take a look at all the shows on television that reify, that valorize competition. I mean, I love to cook. Do people here love to cook? You ever look at this cooking channel? I look at it, I mean, when I'm doing my workout in the morning, I usually took, and by the way, it's always better if you haven't eaten. Cooking channel's always really nice if you haven't eaten, because if really, you've already eaten, eh, it's not, it's not so much fun. But do you know how much competition? What, all these competitions on this show, what are they called? You know, like, um, um, Chopped. Ever, see that show, Chopped? I mean, you, you've got to try and make a really nice dinner in like 20 minutes efficiency, and who wins or loses, you know, and, oh, I'm, I want to give $10,000 to my mom. Ah, oh, you lost, sorry, you got chopped. They turn everything into a, an efficiency-based competition. Everything, the stock market, everything is based on competition, right? And I remember when, when President Clinton, when we, when we signed NAFTA, he said, we have to do this to show that we are going to win in the global competition, economic competition. We're going to win, America. Finally, we're winners again. You may have heard that recently from a president. And I was wondering, is that OK? Do we really want Mexico to be the loser? Do we really want the Philippines to be the loser and have mass unemployment? 
and have starvation? No environmental regs. No, is that really, is that, is that, that good? Is that, that where we are? Rollo May, the great psychologist, said the competition is the ethic of isolation. It isolates you against everyone else in a blood sport for survival. And the terrible thing about it, and most of, many of us have experienced this, I know I have, is that when you lose in this competitive game, this blood sport, when our society has become, and even worse under the current regime, it doesn't, you don't drop out. You just try and work harder. And that's sad because everything from the bedroom to the boardroom now is competitive. We're all like competitive commodities at the, you know, looking for the date, looking, you know, getting online. Everyone's in a commodity trying to sell yourself to a boss, trying to sell yourself to a college, trying to sell your child to a private kindergarten versus the other kids. Everything is competition. Everything is based on that. And that's certainly the ethic of the current administration. What's, is that how we should treat living things, whether they be our plants, animals, ourselves, our children? What should, what, what's the, op, that's cold evil. What's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the ethic we should be treating with? Cooperation, what else? That's great, cooperation I think is the primary one, yeah. But also care, care and cooperation, right? Empathy, right? I'm with you. I walk in your shoes. I don't try and take your shoes. Now, you know, I, you can check this out. I, uh, this recently was up on Huffington Post last week or two weeks ago. I don't know. I wrote a piece, and it's important, I think, in this, to try and change this ethic, where I mentioned that if you look at everybody in America who gets up to take care of something, not to make more money, and by the way, organic people make profit, a lot of the good people here are making profit. On their, that's, I'm not saying profit is always bad, certainly not. But... Putting that aside, all the people that get up in the morning to take care, which means to protect, to maintain, to care for something or someone or something in our country, it's about 40 million adults. Many more than are in manufacturing, many more than are in finance. Yeah. That's all the people that, we, that are out there, like my organization, all the NGOs out there, that's, that's the 14 million stay at voluntarily stay at home moms and dads. That's our military. That's all the firemen, it's all the policemen, it's all the people that are working in our parks, all the people that are working the nurses, all the social workers. No, they're not getting up every morning to try and be competitive with anybody. They're getting up as part of America's care community. 40 million strong. When was the last time you saw a television show on that? When was the last time you saw them honored? And then go back and see how many channels tomorrow are going to be devoted to the stock market, competition, sports. So efficiency has to be balanced with empathy and love when dealing with anything that's living. And any organic farmer, any farmer I work with, that's, they love their land. They love what they do. And competition has to be balanced with cooperation empathy, and mutual respect. That's how we can look at this, this change in consciousness. And there's a couple of other things. One of the other problems that we have that is really behind a lot of this, and this Vern Purcell told me too, he said, Andy, unless we do this, you see pigs just are not in and of themselves good enough. They don't represent progress, right? So let's take a look at progress, because people often assume that progress means more genetic engineering, more patenting, more free market. Well, to me, progress is an incomplete sentence. What does progress mean? What does progress mean to you? Progress towards what? Right? That's the question you have to answer. When I go to colleges and I lecture, and I talk to these college kids, they have lost the capacity quite often to imagine that they can actually redefine progress to something that they want, a society that they would actually want to live in. Well, that's tragic. Because that is the question. Progress doesn't exist. It's, a, it's an incomplete sentence. Progress towards what? It's like when somebody says to you, hey, my friend Charlie made good. And you wait and you wait. He says, what's the matter? 
made good what? Shoes, poems, crops, food? Incomplete sentence. Is a world full of genetically engineered crops that feed virtually no one? Is a world where 10 billion animals suffer unconscionable torture every day? Is that progress? No. No. And that's one of the great things about organic. Organic says no to the three great technologies of modernity. It says no to chemicals. It says no to biotechnology. And it says no to radiation. Well, those are three great technologies the last 150 years. Organic says no. And then organic has the nerve to say, and that, my friends, is progress. So when you buy organic, you aren't just buying a much better product for the earth and for yourselves. And it is a much better product. It's a product that's not going to have clopyrifos. It's not going to uh, interfere with your child's brain development. It's not going to give you uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Or it, it, it's not, that's a terribly important and certainly important for this conference. I realize that. But you're also making a statement saying, no, we are redefining progress. We are redefining through our dollar. Through, we are redefining what we mean by progress by saying we want to be closer with nature, we want to participate with nature. We are not going to participate in the ethic of extermination. We are not going to participate in treating life as machine through efficiency, and we are not going to live in a world of, of we're, we're going to live in a world of co-ops, literally agricultural co-ops and food co-ops. So those are a few of the pillars of my sermon. The, Last one really gets to me a little bit because uh, my good friend Ralph Nader, people here know Ralph Nader? Yes? I know, 2000, wasn't great. But he's still a really good friend and a teacher of mine and uh, helped get me get into the legal work I do. But Ralph invented a term I don't like, which is the consumer. Right? You're all consumers, right? You like being consumers? You know what they used to call tuberculosis? Consumption, why? Because they ate the bodies of their victims. Fires consume. What a terrible, cold, evil way to think of just all of us as mass consumers. You see in all these horrifying telev television commercials where for some reason everyone's dancing. No I don't know anybody who dances anymore, sadly, but everyone's dancing on television commercials and all these adults are acting like nine-year-olds. <laughs> Stupid consumers. If you, if you watch the inculcation of this, it's really amazing. Now, whether we like it or not, in this cold evil system that we talked about, whether it be the animals, whether it be the killing through the, 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 the biocides, we are, through every choice you and I make, every day, every day, we are either increasing this cold evil system of industrial agriculture or finding a new, this new alternative of organic and beyond. Every choice we make. You may not, you may, I don't, I'm not always saying I'm on the top of that mountain. I'm just saying this is not just an environmental crisis. It's not just a human health issue. It is a moral issue on which you decide. If you eat industrial meat today, you have become part of that system. You're not a mere consumer. You are a creator. One way or the other, you are creating a different future for your body, for your children, for your community, for these animals, and for the earth. I mean, when you talk about healthy food, healthy human, healthy planet, that, yes, that's, that's, that's our motto and a lot of other people's motto, but it's also a moral choice. A moral choice that we all have to make. And if you lose it one day, that's okay. Like any other one. Like any, like, you know, like any other sermon, you can be saved tomorrow. And that's the great thing about this food issue. That is the great thing about this food issue, which is that you can make choices today. You can make choices. I can make choices that affect the whole system. That's not true whether we stay in Afghanistan war. It's not true even about nuclear power. It's not true about how we can affect a lot of their energy grid. But it is true of food. We can all make those choices. We are, that's what makes us such an exciting, exciting field to work in that I've been working in for so many years, is that you can empower, you can change. I would never have dreamed 10 years ago that you would walk into an Exxon station and see four different types of organic milk. I would never have dreamed that I would turn on the TV last night and see not one, but five different commercials, including a pet food commercial that said non-GMO. Now, we're making a lot of progress. Now, let me get a little more specific here at the end, and then we'll go to questions. Um, 
One of the problems I think that we face is it's not always clear what the alternative is. You know, you say, well, I get it. I mean, I, I know organic's good, but I mean, you know, organic sort of tells us what not to do. I mean, how, how, how do I get, I want healthy food, I want a healthy person, I want a healthy plant, but what does it actually mean? It just sort of goes away and kind of diaphanous. Thank you.